You're listening to That Gets My Go. That was your first mistake. Hi, everybody. Welcome to That Gets My Goat. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. This is the show where we complain about things. Yeah? So do you have something to complain about, Mr. Rich Outfield? Yes, there's something I'd like to complain about. I don't know if you've been hearing these things, but they, there was always PSAs on the radio. I mean, when In the golden age of television, when it first began, every station was supposed to donate x number of hours of a day to public service announcements to news to educational programming i think that's all been done away with practically uh, but on the radio they still every once in a while will have psas and all that and they're all supposed to slot them and and but you'll get these really inane psas because they're not for profit and they're you know they're always really badly done knowing is half the battle type psas i think that was designed just to placate like some parents council that were like you should not be allowed to have a 30 minute commercial for toys but the 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 newest one is really obnoxious it's a a texting you know you shouldn't be texting while driving psa and i'd heard them before and and you know my views on the whole texting phenomenon i mean i wrote that story uh subtext because when i worked at the news where you work I edited a story about a teenage girl who she was in the car with three other friends and all of them were texting, including the girl who was driving. They either got hit by a train or a semi truck or something like that. And a bunch of them died and everybody was so upset. But the people they were most upset with were the people who said they shouldn't have been texting because that was insensitive. And you know what? It is insensitive, but it doesn't make it untrue. And so, yeah, I've always been like, hey, come on, man. You guys don't don't text. And especially when you have three people in the car, she can text for you. The, the girl in the passenger <laughs> seat and the one in the back seat. Anyway, I mean, that was a segue, a, a different kind of segue. The, the, the current PSA, the one that really bothers me. Now, you have heard it, right? I, I believe so. The old PSAs were logical. And it was like, oh my god, I can't believe that. Jimmy's going to ask me out. He's like, would you go out with Jimmy? Yes or no? Send the text. <laughs> Crash. And it's like, please don't send frivolous texts while driving. That's dangerous. But the one that they've started playing now, it has this guy. And it's got this sad piano music playing. And he says, dear honey, thank you for three years of marriage. You've made me the happiest man ever. I love <laughs> And then this narrator says, you know, Dexter St. Cloud was texting I love you to his wife when he crashed his car and burned to death screaming. No text is worth making while you're driving. And it just bothers the crap out of me that they choose something like totally sweet and understand. I mean, you know, there's, there's so many spurious, worthless, stupid texts that you could make. But they choose this guy saying I love you to his wife like that piece of crap. <laughs> he should have friggin' no- you know what? Anybody is better than this guy. F him. <laughs> Am I crazy? Do you know what I'm talking about? I think you might be a little overworked, a little ex- maybe. <laughs> have you heard it? I have. Um, and you didn't have this reaction at all. No, I, I I I'm the same kind of person as you. I also have edited I've I worked with you when was that five six years ago and you stopped working there I still work there I've been doing stories about people who die from texting again and again and so I'm a hundred times more against it than you you'd have to be but it's but you didn't feel like that this commercial was I don't want to say misleading I don't even want to say insincere but it was poorly done you could say that. I think maybe what they're trying to tell you, like you said, no text is worth it. If, what I remember from it is this guy was texting I love you from his wife when he accidentally ran over three children. Oh, that's right. Right. They have to make the consequences much worse than just him dying. It's all shit, man. There's no man that did this. Solomon Grundy say there is. I, I bet you there is. I'm pretty sure I cut the story about him. It's a lie. Five times. Well, see, I thought that it... This month. (laughs) Listen to you. I thought that it couldn't get any worse. But just today, 
I heard another one. I mean, in fact, we, do we have that? Because I'd asked you just to yes, save yes, it. Yes, we have it. Can we play that for the audience, please? All right. I've given it a lot of thought, Marie, and I've decided to forgive you for the affair. You and the kids are too important to me to throw everything away on something so... Andrew Oxnard was texting his wife when he slammed into a bus filled with innocent, handicapped children. No text is worth making in the car. A message from the U.S. Safe Driving Board. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's just me. It, it, it's heavy-handed. That's the word I'm looking for. That's that's what I think that that PSA was. If you're listening at home, maybe you disagree. I don't know. What did you think of that PSA? Uh, you might say that's a little heavy-handed. So I have no room to complain. I, I, you think that my 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 complaints are unfounded? I guess. That maybe the means justify the wait the ends justify the means as long as they actually get people to not text in the car, then even terrible, crappy, heavy-handed stuff is still okay because I would live with that being every commercial if it saved one even one person's life, especially if that one person were me. All right, you're a decent <laughs> guy. Okay, well then let, let's let's change the subject. Well, it w- we were unable to do episodes of our regular show, and that gets my goat for a long, long time. And I thought, well, we should at least sit down and briefly, if that's possible, explain what's been going on with us. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea, because it's been a little crazy, a little weird. It's There's been a lot of stuff that's kind of gotten in the way of the show, so I guess it's probably nice to... Explain ourselves. You've got some splaining to do. That's right. And we were going to do this last week, but you had that furry convention that you needed yeah, to go to. Yeah, there was a big furry convention in town, and I wasn't going to miss that. <laughs> no. All five days you didn't <laughs> want to miss. Man, I love furry. I just don't understand those things. Uh, anyhow, boy, I don't know what to start with. Like the the, the Boba Fett episode? We did that Boba one. Fett. <laughs> <laughs> we did that one when you were... Homeless the first time. Oh, where were you? I was. I was still. We were still in the apartment at that point. I think. Oh right, right. Okay, the apartment. But your car had broken down that day as well. Oh yeah. We were going to record a whole bunch of things, if you recall, and car wouldn't start, and so on. No, I think it was. I had a flat tire that day. (laughs) Yeah, I went out to uh, go and meet you, and my tire was flat. And so instead of meeting you at the pizza place, I said, "Ah, "Come, just come over to my house, and hopefully, I'll have the tire changed by the time you get here, and we can go from here." But yeah, that was kind of just the way my luck ran this summer, at least. Maybe this year. Um, well, last year you got evacuated from your house. <laughs> and on the same day, you wrecked your car and you had to take your son to the hospital. Or you went to the hospital. Both of you went to the hospital. That was a really, really terrible day. But is it possible that this summer was worse? Well, if you piled it all up, it, it definitely was hell was that it was one of those alerts that you get on your phone oh that you don't ask for but every app wants you to subscribe for them and yeah i'm sure it's something that i don't care about if i could pull it out it's probably like a news story on stitcher saying you know what this is happening right now and i'll be like give a mother flying f anyways i'm sorry so i had been asking you was this summer actually worse than the last at the very least, it was on par. But yeah, you could probably say it was worse. Because basically, yeah, I mean, I spent the whole summer homeless. I mean, it was good because we were we sold our house, which is something that we needed to do. And it went really well. We got it up. We put it up for sale. And by the end of that week, it was sold. The real thing was we made the big mistake. The people who bought it from us were people who, you know, they were... They were buying extra homes and just renting them out to people. You know, they had a bunch of money and they were using that as a way to make more money. You know, they're buying homes and renting them. And when they bought the home for us, they offered, until your new home is ready, you can rent this home from us. All we ask is a three-month minimum. Three months. And uh, we're just like, oh, it's not going to be three months. So we don't want to do that. And they wanted, you know, the rent was going to be more than what we were paying for our mortgage. And we're just like, we can't handle to pay this much more a month. Although we're going to pay that much more when we actually get into our new house. But, you know, 
we got this time over the summer where we can save money. And so, yeah, we decided against renting our home back from these people. Yeah, that was probably a mistake, pretty big mistake. And my dad even said, you know, I think you should probably do that. You, you should go for it because those home builders, they always take longer than they say. Mm. And we're like, yeah, well, we've got this apartment we're going to rent and they're going to give us, you know, a couple extra weeks. So we should be fine. But we did. I mean, it seemed like everything was going perfect at first because the house sold. We found an apartment that we could rent until the end of July, which is was hard. I mean, we looked around and people don't rent for short periods. You know what I mean? They don't want to do that. They're like, you sign a lease for a year. And obviously we couldn't do that because that would have been like 10 months longer than we expected to be in the place. But we managed to find somebody on Craigslist that would rent to us because they were just going out of town for the summer. Mm. And so they were trying to find some way to offset their costs of that. And so they wanted to rent their place out for just the summer. And uh, so, yeah, we, we were all we were so excited. Everything was working out. We we're going to be able to save all this money and everything. But, yeah, it came to the end of July. And the house was not ready or... More appropriately, the more correct way to say it is the financing was not ready. It had to go through a bunch of hoops. And it seemed like it should be any day now that it was going to be ready. So we figured, okay, well, we're going on vacation to Canada here really shortly. So probably by the time we get back from Canada, it will be ready to go and we'll be able to just move right in. We'll even come home. I had two weeks off to go for Canada vacation. We decided we'd come home early so we could use the last couple of days of the vacation to move in, use those those free days. But you had already planned on going to Canada? Because, see, my understanding was that you had had this time off so you could move into the house and then relax a little bit. But once it looked like you were going to be homeless, you're like, well, we'll just go to the in-laws place crash there until the financing goes through but it was already planned you would go to canada right yeah we had already planned to go to canada the first the start of august so that was you know we were like oh it'll be all right we'll be have somewhere to stay we just needed a couple days because we the end of july was like a wednesday so we had to move out on wednesday and then we were leaving for canada on saturday so we had to find some place to go in between that and that was the start of my my homelessness my couch surfing I always hear that when I'm doing stories on the news about homeless people. They always talk about, you know, there's this many homeless people out there, but there's also this many people who are on the verge of being homeless. They're just couch surfing. They're staying at some relative's house or a friend's house and could be next week that they get kicked out and then they'll have nowhere to go and they'll be homeless now. That was kind of me. I was the one of those types. We went to my dad's house and stayed there one night, the first night after we moved out of the apartment. And we actually had my kids go and stay at their friend's house. So it was just me and my wife and the baby that was at my dad's house. And then my sister was also going on a big vacation for two weeks. And so she's like, why don't you stay at my house? Because we'll be gone. This is before Canada. Yeah. She's like, we'll be gone for two weeks. So you could just stay at my place. And And house it. Yeah, basically be a house sitter, and then and, and, and she would still be gone when we got back from Canada, so we kind of had a place to go for a while, so we were at my sister's house. For but you wouldn't days. need that, because you were going to yeah. get to move in. Yeah, we figured we'd be back in, but just in case, you know, we even still had time afterwards. So yeah, we went to my sister's house, then we went to the in-law's house, we came back to my sister's house, and while we were in Canada, we got the news that, no, no, it's not ready, still haven't heard anything. Hasn't made it through the hoops. Because, yeah, it was a rural housing loan because we're out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, had to go through, like, the, I think it was a USDA, which seems weird. Because aren't they the ones that, like, inspect beef and stuff? The U.S. But it is the Department of Agriculture. So I guess that kind of makes sense that they're somehow over the rural housing loans. Because rural is agricultural areas, I guess. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, it was, I think it was just that, you know, the, you know, the economy was kind of coming out and housing stuff was starting to pick up again. And so I think that they were just overloaded. And so they had way more than they could deal with because everybody's like, oh, yes, I've been waiting for five years to sell my house. Now it's my chance. Like us. (laughs) So, 
Yeah, it just happened to be in that bottleneck, and yeah, we're still waiting. My sister got back from her vacation, and uh, I had a friend who, they were selling their house and moving to California. They hadn't sold their house yet, but they were moved out of it, and they're like, oh, why don't you just stay at our house until yours is ready? So we went, and we stayed at my friend's empty house for a while, but my friend, he took his family to California then he came back to kind of like fix up his house and stuff like that and it got to be a bit of a problem because you know he'd be like hammering away trying to get stuff fixed and ready to sell his house while my wife is like trying to sleep and has to be at work at three in the morning and she's just like oh my gosh I'm gonna get like two hours of sleep now oh somebody shoot me that sounds like her always <laughs> yeah that's kind of true but but yeah, then finally, so we went, we left there. Oh, well, well, no, no. Now, I heard it differently. I heard that he was trying to sell the house. Mm-hmm. So there were always people coming over. Oh, it was, was an open house. <laughs> and you were in the shower, and people came into the house to see the house and your wares. Yeah, that, that did happen, too. Yeah, that was uh, an, another part that kind of... Made us think, boy, we better find somewhere else to go. I wasn't quite in the shower. I had just gotten out of the shower. I didn't have a shirt on yet. I did actually have something covering my wares. So at least there was that. It was a sock, folks. <laughs> but uh, One of those little ankle socks. Yeah, it was. Oddly <laughs> enough. I mean, ironically, no. The opposite of irony. Enough. Fittingly? Fittingly. Well, yeah, it, it didn't a, quite it was, fit. Yeah, it was a little small, actually. But... <laughs> But uh, you also told me that he had like this huge list of things that you guys were doing wrong while staying at his house and that they were, uh, you guys made a mess in here and I'm trying to show this house off and I need you to clean this up and clean this up in between going to work at three o'clock in the morning. And, and I think at this point, your car was so unreliable that sometimes you would have to share the same car in the same day. I maybe, maybe I'm compiling do different events here but yeah the car the car problem came later um but yeah it was a little uh, it was a little interesting we did have some some issues and so yeah we decided it'd be best if we moved on and there, my my wife's friend at work had been trying to convince us to come and stay with her she's like oh we got this basement downstairs that we don't use you know, I mean, all it's got its own family room. It's got a Wii. It's got TV. There are a couple of rapey ghosts, but other than that, it's fine. You could have your own bed. There's a bed. You know, she was really wow. Kinda, she's really selling this. Yeah, sell it to us, and and she's like, oh, well, I don't know how I would cook for you, and we do all this That's stuff. Right. She said it won't cost much. Just your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other th- addition is by th- this. This has dragged on so long that now school is back in session. And you told me that it would take a half an hour to get from where you were staying to take the kids to school. And the the school days were stilted. So the boy had to go to school like 45 minutes before the girls, but you couldn't afford to go back and make two trips. So you'd have to load them all into the car pre-dawn, drive all the way over to your son's school, drop him off, and then just like hang out and read or play at the playground or something and yep. tell your kids, girls. That's what start. we did. Yeah. We had, I, my son, I would get him up at 630 so oh. that he could be ready for school. And normally I let the other two sleep until later because their school doesn't start till nine. But in this case, you know, it was all one trip. So yeah, we'd all get up at the same time and then we'd all get in the car and I'd even have to take the baby with me. We drive all the way across town to where the school was. I'd drop off my son, and yeah, then we'd go find a park and waste an hour. And I tried to use it as a way to, you know, oh, I'll just do my jogging now. And so I had the the, the girls play with the baby, and I jogged around in circles around the park. But I'm not sure what the deal is, but it's it's amazing how quickly kids will get bored of a park if... You force them to stay there. You know what I mean? It's like if they can choose to go to the park, then oh, they love it. And they'll be there all day long. And you're like, okay, let's go. And like, I mean, it's going to swing for a little bit longer. But yeah, if you're like, okay, we're going to stay here for an hour. So have fun. It's like, no, this isn't any fun. Oh, can we go? Uh, whatever it is that you want them to do, they're going to want the opposite. So yeah, I start jogging and like I get like one lap around. And they're like, hey, is it time to go? It's like, no, get back over there and play. 
Have fun. <laughs> no treats for you until you finish your Sunday. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that Simpsons, but that always cracked me up. Like, no brownies for you until you finish your Sunday, Bart. He's like, oh, do I have to? Oh. <laughs> But yeah, that was a bit of a pain. I had to do that for like a week. And uh, yeah, then we moved over to this other friend's house, which originally my wife didn't want to do that because it's just like, oh gosh, everywhere we go, it's like we, we're ruining every relationship we have with anyone from each place that we go kind of a thing. And it's just like, oh, do we need to do this with this person? But in the end, we, we finally did. And it was kind of interesting uh, her house, A, was really, really nice. It was, like, perfectly, immaculately clean. So it's just like, oh, uh -oh. we want to have the kids in here. Yikes. But that didn't really cause any problem. But, yeah, it was kind of weird because we never, ever, like, they had three stories, right? There's the stories, the upstairs stories, which is where they had their bedrooms. There's the main floor. Then there was this basement that we stayed in. And so we would go up to the main floor. We almost never saw them. It was just, I mean, I know that, A, they have the same crazy schedule that my wife has. So it's not surprising that I never saw them because I never see my wife either. We were joking about that with her one time and she's like, oh, I'm coming downstairs. You better hurry. I'm, I'm going to make a rare appearance. So we actually ran upstairs so we could actually talk to her and make it feel like we weren't, I don't know. It was like we were hiding in somebody's house. It was like we were those kids on the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frank Further, Frank Weiler, the kids that lived in the museum, they'd like sneak into some place at night and because the Germans had taken over Austria and they and this the Frank family had to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, it's just one of the, I don't know. They just run away kids. One of those kids books happens. There's a lot of kids books about runaways, it seems, and a lot about orphans. Maybe it's just an easy subject to go to. Yeah, not a lot about rapey ghosts, though. Yeah, we, we, me and you are going to change that. But yeah, so we lived homeless forever. So all of this time, what are the finance people telling you? Because I remember you saying, oh, we had a, de a date that they said it would be good by. And yeah. No, okay, they said it'll be a couple more days. You'll know by fr Friday we'll, you know. Yeah, um, they were doing that kind of stuff. I mean, first of all, we call and they go, oh, we haven't heard, but, you know, it's... They, you say it's usually this many days, and it's been two less than that. So, you know, we should should hear soon. And then, yeah, five days would go by, and we don't hear anything from them. So we call them back. And we, after a while, we felt like we are like those really annoying people. We're sure that they're like, oh, these people calling again, kind of a thing. But I didn't give a crap, you know, because I was freaking homeless. But, yeah, it was it was a real pain. And yeah, they kept saying, oh, yeah, it should be any time. And then when the day finally came, they're like, oh, yeah, it just cleared this morning. And we always close within 24 hours. So tomorrow, uh, all we need is the uh, appraiser to go out and take the final pictures of the place. And then we can uh, we can close this deal. And I'm like, OK, so tomorrow at four, he's like, well, let me first get a hold of the uh, appraiser and find out when he can go out so we can schedule the time for the closing after that. And the whole day goes by. It's five o'clock. And I'm like... These places, these people are going to be closed in a second. So I call him back. He's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm still trying to find out about the appraisal. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to have to take the day off to sign these papers because, you know, news shows happen at certain times and I can't just up and leave and then come back. It doesn't work that way where I work. So do I take the day off for tomorrow? Are we signing it for tomorrow, like you said, or not? Oh, oh, well, do, let's just make it Wednesday because we know for sure it'll be Wednesday. And I was like, dude, I'm homeless. Let's do it tomorrow instead for sure. How's that sound? Um, Once that appraiser guy came in and took the pictures, though, we just came over here. We brought our mattress, our air mattress. We'd been sleeping on at uh, my friend's house where he had moved his family out already. And we just set it up. We just put them into the rooms. We're like, yeah, we're just going to stay here tonight. We had the code to the garage so we could get in, so we just did. Like, screw that. We're coming in. We're squatting. So it all worked out then. No further problems at all. <laughs> Thank goodness. You know, because you just about had enough. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's an We signed the papers on Wednesday. And we're all set. And we're like, yeah, sweet. And then 
Thursday, my wife gets a call in the morning. She's like, yeah, we went to put your papers through and we realized and they wouldn't go through because there was a problem. And uh, what happened was your homeowner's insurance quote was wrong. And they sent us this quote, but they really want this much for it. And so we're going to have to send it back through USDA and wait another month. And we're just like, oh, <laughs> A, we've already moved to like by this point. I mean, like Thursday, because like, you know, Tuesday night, we'd moved in some stuff. All day Wednesday, we moved stuff in until we went and signed papers. Wednesday night, all the way through, we moved as much crap. We had a lot of crap here already. It's like, dude, we're not moving this crap back out. <laughs> we're here. It, it was kind of funny because the deal was our homeowner's insurance quote that they gave us was one of those where if you had your homeowner's insurance and all your auto insurance through them, you got a special discount. So that was what the quote was for. And so... Basically, the answer that the guy who, you know, our, our finance guy, our loan bro- mortgage broker, I think they call him, he was just like, oh, yeah, why don't, why don't you just change your insurance over? My wife was like, but I like our insurance. They were so good when we crashed the car last summer. I don't want to leave them. And I'm just like, yeah, well, you know, you've been homeless for a month and that sucks. As much as I loved our insurance, they're not holding me for that. But yeah, my wife was just like, I don't want to do that. But then she called the uh, new place and she's like, and they're going to be cheaper too. Our, our, the people we're with right now is way cheaper than this other one. But yeah, she called them up and found out it was actually 10 bucks cheaper, which made me laugh when she called me back and told me. I was just like, you're like, I wouldn't have cared that they were 10 bucks cheaper, right? <laughs> I would have been happy if they were, you know, 20 bucks more expensive or whatever. And yeah, it turns out to even be cheaper. So, so yeah, in the end, we just switched over to this other place and we managed to be able to stay in our house but oh my gosh yeah that was crazy to get that call after we'd signed the papers and they're just like oh no no it's gonna be another month yeah so yeah we did manage to at last get into our house and we're there now uh yeah we're sitting in the uh the study i think we talked about it on the main show wasn't it because we actually recorded here last week as well yeah, we talked about the the kind of the having a study, having a place of that's mine. It's my room because you know once you get married, your bedroom is not your bedroom. Your bedroom is your wife's bedroom. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't like put a poster of Return of the Jedi up in your bedroom unless you got an equally nerdy wife that, as you are, as I am. We'll say because I would put a Return of the Jedi poster up if I could, but my wife would not stand for that. So, yeah, the room gets decorated in the way that she wants it to be. And I've always figured, okay, well, I'm going to have a study and that will be my room. She can have the bedroom. That can be her room. She can do frilly pillowcases and put the 16 rows of pillows on the freaking bed. So you got to go through and, like, pull them all off just so you can get in bed and go to sleep and stuff. Why? What, 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 what are all those pillows for? I have no idea why girls like many pillows. But... It's all for looks, obviously, because you can't sleep on them. But, you know, whatever. I don't care. She she wants to do that as long as I have my place. But I, I kept losing my place. There was a time where I had the study in the old house. And then, oh, no, we need to put one of the kids up here. It needs to be their bedroom instead of your study. And so all my stuff went away. And then we, we finished the basement. Oh, this is going to be your study right here in the basement. And then all of a sudden, no, we've got a new baby. So now we need that as another the, the kid who took my study before... Oh, when it was upstairs is now taking my study again when it's downstairs. So yeah, at last I've got that place. And it's pretty exciting to have. I've, I've pulled out my boxes and boxes of toys, which unfortunately have overwhelmed. I've got all these bookshelves and there's very few books on it because of all my toys. And also the fact that I got tired. I used to collect books pretty heavily when I first got married. I got so sick of moving them from place to place just to leave them in boxes and never even take them out and look at them because I had no place to put them. And so finally I just quit getting books and now I've got all these bookshelves and no books to put on them. (laughs) But you picked me one up the other day from the thrift store, right? So we're on our way. Yeah, we're slowly going to fill all these shelves. And you said that you were going to get more shelves too, so you're you're planning ahead. Yeah, they're supposed to go all the way to the ceiling. So we still got... What does that make? Eight more shelves to put on. So, Wow. Well, thank goodness you had no further problems with anything on the end of that. 
And, uh, and yeah, you didn't mention that your job continually took advantage of you as they always do. And you had to work double shifts or you had to cover for somebody else's shift or everybody likes to take vacation in June and July and August and September, you know, all the times when you were homeless. Although I guess you weren't homeless in September, were you? No, yeah, we actually uh, signed the papers, I think, the 28th. So we were homeless for nearly an entire month when we thought we were going to, you know, when we left that apartment at the end of July, we're thinking, okay, it'll be maybe a week, probably less. We'll probably get a call halfway through saying that it's ready. And no, it was four weeks from that point. Four entire weeks. It was the 28th. But yeah, it's funny that you say there was no further problems because... uh, I can't remember if it was the day after we signed the papers or the day before when I got rear-ended. That was the day you and I got together. You and I had lunch because you had to do the late schedule instead of the regular one. Oh, yeah, that's right. Then I called you because you hadn't logged in at work. Yeah, it was. And you said, I'm not at work, dude. (laughs) It was the day that we, we met down at the mall. This was uh, like a week before we signed the papers. I had gone to meet Rish and... uh, Yeah, you and I saw each other once during that homeless period. And I I talked about it before that we did the Drabblecast episode mm -hmm. that time. But then you said, hey, I don't have to go to work until late. Let's do lunch. And so we got together and ate lunch. And then, yeah, like you said, you you didn't make it to work on time. I didn't. Yeah, I got rear-ended in the parking lot. Because I had the baby with me when we were uh, meeting for lunch, and I had to take him and trade him off, give him to my wife, and then go to work from there. And so when I met her, I gave her the baby, and then as I was pulling out of the parking lot, somebody rear-ended me. And it was a really wimpy little crash. It was probably like a 10-mile-an-hour crash. I had started to drive forward and then could see that I wasn't going to make it into the space that I was hoping to squeeze into. And so I stopped again and the guy saw me, you know, start to pull forward. And I'm sure he turned to talk to his wife or whatever he was doing. And so he pulled forward and thump, I was still there. But it bent my trunk up and scratched my bumper. Um, He had a bigger car, like an SUV. And I had my little, you know, it was a little sedan. And I was down lower too, so that only made it worse. He had absolutely no, not a scratch on his car. You couldn't tell. Although I think his little plastic license plate cover thing, you know, those little things that you get that says like, whatever, Chevrolet, Geo, Daihatsu, uh, <laughs> whatever those, that I think that was his one damage was that got cracked. Aww. And his license plate was a little bent, so he just bent it back straight and he was done. He was good. But yeah, my car, I took it, eventually took it to the shop to get it looked at. And... The damage was enough that they said, yeah, we're just going to total your car because your car is old, has high mileage. It's not worth fixing. And when we heard how much the estimate was for just to fix the hood, we're like, we're not putting that money into this car. We're taking that money and getting something else anyway. So even if they hadn't totaled it, we would have. But but didn't you feel a little bit sad because that car had been oh so reliable? (laughs) Yeah, it's funny because that same day we were thinking, yeah, maybe we should get a new car. And then I drove to work and the car broke down. Luckily, I was pulling off the freeway. I was thinking, I want a soda. And I can pull right in here and get one at this McDonald's. So I pulled off the freeway and the car died and I had to push it out of the way. But it was kind of fortuitous because it died right in front of a car, an auto repair shop. And like a car rental shop as well. They were both right there within like a minute's walking distance. I was just like, wow, who'd have thought? That's really weird. So I actually pushed my car. Rather than get it towed, I just pushed it to the auto repair shop. And they said, yeah, it's going to cost you $500 to get this thing fixed. And we're like, no, it isn't because we're not getting it fixed. And so, yeah, I went and that very day we... uh, Found ourselves a new car and bought one. And that car is actually still at the rental shop. They called me this morning and said, hey, if you don't get it out of here, we're going to have it towed away. I said, okay, well, the insurance should be coming for it soon. Because they've totaled it and they get it. Whatever they do with it. But yeah, so 
I got a new car and a new house within the same week. And last week we recorded, we started recording late because of that. I had come straight from the car, the auto dealer that we bought the car from to here to meet you to record. So that was uh, interesting. So that's been my summer. Yeah, we would have recorded all this then. Yeah, last week had we gotten together at normal what, time. What time? 11 o'clock before we got together? It was pretty late. Yeah, we didn't get started on time, that's for sure. But I wasn't the only one that had a bad summer, right? Well, it's Syria. They. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember. I mean, I have no money. But, uh... No, I mean, I had a ton of car problems. And, you know, I had to get the brakes changed and for some reason there's something wrong with the axle or whatever so the one side of the car always makes the tires bald and i don't know it's somebody threw a rock chip onto my windshield and <laughs> it was on a sunday and so i was like okay well tomorrow i'll get it fixed and by monday it had like spread it became a giant spider uh, and so of course on monday they said oh you know we, we we're gonna have to replace that windshield of yours and that was at safe light repair safe light replace and and so I was just like, oh shoot, how much is that going to be? And they told me, and I was like, oh geez. Then I just stopped at some other place just to ask them because they were on the way, and they're like, oh yeah, we can fix that in twenty minutes or ten, fifteen minutes, and for you know twenty five dollars or whatever. And they just, I'm not sure what they do. They put some kind of stuff on the glass that like melts it. I don't know if they maybe it's superheated thing so that the I, the glass becomes liquid again i don't know anyway it just leaves like a sort of a splotch over where the the rock chip was really and it happens to be right there in my field of vision right in front of me that's perfect but (laughs) it's still better than getting so while you're uh, texting and driving you don't even notice that the uh the person is crossed in front of you because they're kind of blurred no you can't see the vehicles in front of you at all it's great nice (laughs) and now a word from our sponsor howard I know I wasn't the best stepson to you over the years, but I want you to know now, before it's too late, that I was very lucky to have you raise me. You are my dad, Howard, and I love you so much for... Stephen O'Malley was sending some unnecessary message to his dying stepfather in the hospital when his car drove off an embankment, taking out an electric plant and plunging an entire city into darkness, including the same hospital that was keeping his stepfather alive. No text is worth making in the car. A message from the U.S. Safe Driving Board. Oh, wow, there's more of those. Apparently, they're uh, they're not getting the point across. They have to be more heavy-handed. <laughs> there you go. Ham-fisted, even. Ooh. I, I know what you're getting at. I almost don't want to talk about it because it just seems so menial compared to being homeless for three months, weeks, hours. Menial, huh? Is that not, am I not using that word correctly? Menial, lowly and sometimes degrading, servile and submissive, pertaining to or suitable for domestic servants, humble. So I guess I knew not what I was talking about. I think you did use that word wrong. It seems so... I'm not sure which word you were actually going for that's similar. That's what I always find is the case when I use the wrong word. There's another word that's close to it that I missed. It said the wrong thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I also had a bad summer. Ben Affleck was cast as Batman. Aww. No, uh, th- th- it was just last week. There was a convention in uh, Effington, and I took my niece to it. And it was her first ever convention. She was super excited. It was a comic convention. Nice. Effington and is a beautiful effing place. It, it is. And uh, <laughs> we were having a good time. At, oh, and it was just me and my cousin and my niece and my nephew. And at one point, my cousin got a call from his wife. That's, that's like, the rain is going out of control, and there's flooding in the basement, and you need to come home right now. And that was the day we hadn't driven up. The other days we drove. That day we took the train just so my five-year-old nephew could ride a train for the first oh, time. Oh, nice. I've done that with my kids a couple of times too. And so, yeah, he immediately like said, I got to go. I'll take off. And so we didn't think anything of it. But uh, when it came time for us to go home, we had to get on one train and go to the other train and wait for that train to get there and get home. But we had missed. Apparently there had been like hurricane level wind and rain and weather that was so unusual for this time of year or or, or this location that, you know, people will be talking about it for years to come. 
we'd missed it all because we were in a big convention center, sheltered from the outside world. But what had happened was, I guess, that there was immeasurable precipitation and it all came down our road and it upended a tree and that tree went into the gutter, into the storm drain or whatever, and blocked the storm drain. So all the water decided, instead of going into the sewers, to go into our basement. And it was four or five inches deep in the basement. And all the neighbors came over and, and my dad came up from his house and my sisters were there. And, and they all had like buckets and their bucket brigade and they ran to some place to rent uh it was like a snow blower only it's for water where hmm. it has like an end that you stick in the water and it blows a jet out the back and and uh apparently once my brother-in-law saw what the problem was and pulled all these branches out of the storm grate the water started to go back into where it was supposed to go but um my sister showed me all these pictures of how deep the water was. And you can see on the walls in every room in the basement and, you know, on the front of the house, the water level mark. And uh, yeah, it had just filled this thing up. So there wasn't a single room in the basement that didn't fill up with water. It went into the closets. It went under the couches and the beds and, uh, and all that stuff. And, and I had missed it. I mean, it, I don't know what good I could have done. One more set of arms bailing water and, yeah. you know, and, and gather, kind of gather, gathering gatherings. End of the line of the bucket brigade, at least. I have two sisters and, and one of them, for some reason, decided it would be her responsibility to make sure my stuff was taken care of and didn't get ruined. And, and had she not, because uh, uh, from what everybody else says, they were all like, well, he's not here. F him. We're going to deal with everything else. He's got his own room. Just leave the door closed and what happens in there happens, which seems just like a ghastly thing to say. But I understand that this was a disaster and it's like every man for themselves. But my sister's like, no, no, I'm going to help. And so I guess she had piled all sorts of stuff on the table and all the, onto the couch. And only the things that had been touching the ground when that big river of water entered the house got ruined. But, and you, you've never been there, so you don't know. All I have is this little tiny room that has a TV and it has, you know, a couch and a desk and a closet and then 80 boxes of crap. And the <laughs> boxes are piled and piled and piled. And I mean, even the couch probably has 14, 15 boxes full of crap on it on the back, you know, going up to the window. And uh, when cardboard gets wet, I guess it sucks in water and it slowly creeps up the side of the box and, you know, just damaging level after level after level of things that are in there. And so uh, when I got home, they had gotten a lot of the water out with this machine, but you know, the damage was still done. And I was just shocked at how could this have happened? And, and they showed me where the lines were and they showed me the pictures of how bad the, the water was. But, you know, I felt bad that I hadn't been there to do something about it. But I felt worse later when I started going through and finding out what had been destroyed. And, and the, the, the funny thing is there were things that I hadn't thought of in years and years. I, I didn't even realize existed. But once they were destroyed, it was like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, I always meant to read that book and now I can't. But like records from my childhood, my high school diploma was ruined. My prom That's okay. Picture. You didn't actually earn it anyways. So. Um, and yeah, there was this big stack of photographs that I'd gotten developed back when you get photographs developed that I hadn't looked at since college. And they were all just like stuck together. And so that when you try and peel them, they just tear. You know what I mean? They were all yeah. ruined. Yeah, it doesn't take much to ruin a photo. Those things are really bad when you add water. Uh, again, talking about worthless things, my CD collection, every single one of those CDs the you know the inserts are all ruined and they're you know all flopping around and all that and i was just like no oh and this and that not taking into consideration i haven't listened to a single one of these cds in five or six years you know what i mean you've got them all on mp3 oh i, I i'm not an mp3 guy but i just cds don't serve the same purpose that they used to. i mean you used to everybody had a stereo and they had their cd collection right next to it and i just yeah i had them in boxes your CD um, collection looks shiny and costly. How much did you pay for your bad motor Uzi? Okay. You'll Dance to Anything by Dead Hot Workshop. 
But uh, yeah, like I had posters and stuff. And, and for some reason, the posters bothered me the most uh, because they were all in frames and they were just up against the wall behind the door. And, and I, you know, the bottoms of the posters got wet and then it just crept up. And a lot of these posters were like signed by people, uh, you know, and you st- stood in a long line or, or in some cases paid somebody to sign them and, and then they're ruined. And I'm trying to think that uh, I had mentioned that there were all these like high school, not high school, college papers and, and stories and things that I wrote and anything that was in a notebook, once the notebook got wet, like all the ink just ran and it, and, and, and it's just like, well, there's no way to fix this. I got to throw it away. And just tons and tons of paperback books and hardcover books. Once the water gets in them, they like expand to triple their size. And like the hardbacks, I didn't realize this would happen. But when a hardback gets wet and expands, the spine eventually just breaks. And it's like, wow, that's like, it's, you know, it's like the Hulk transforming <laughs> in his in his blue work shirt. And yeah, I, I found out later that there was tons of boxes under the stairs that I didn't know about that we had just left that nobody had bothered to get out and try and air out and say, Oh, this let's fix, let's save this and that. And they had just sat there for days and days, you know, in dampness so that everything in the boxes was ruined and not just the stuff on the bottom. And, and it's funny cause I, I'm discovering new things every day that are <laughs> ruined, but uh, because it was considered an act of God, uh, the homeowner's insurance doesn't cover that. They said, uh, you know, if it had been a leaky pipe or something within the house, then yes, you, you know, you, this stuff would be insured, but uh, no, it wouldn't. They'd find a way around that too. <laughs> That's probably insurance true. Insurance is the worst bunch of criminals in the world. There's, you know, mobsters, you know, the, those guys coming around and like hitting people up for protection money on their, those people are more straight shooters. Than freaking insurance people. They are absolutely the worst. That's Well, that's just my personal opinion. We'll just leave it at that. That's how I feel about insurance. They'll find a way out of... and You know, they just want money for nothing and chicks for free. Wait, that, that ain't working. It's not, but that's the way you do it. The, the one thing that was nice, though, was the next day, tons of people came over from the neighborhood to help. Because we had to pull up all the carpet from downstairs and then the pad... Under the carpet had been super glued down onto the cement, and every and so ultimately we had to use shovels to scrape it off of the the cement and uh, get all the furniture out and everything that was downstairs and take it either upstairs or take it out on the front lawn. Like we've got all sorts of stuff still on the front lawn covered in tarps, but it would have been a, just an exhausting, horrible job. Had like twenty people, strangers not come over and said, oh, we'll help with that. And and they did like a bucket brigade there where, you know, somebody was peeling the carpet and somebody was scraping the the pad and then somebody was gathering that into the garbage and then somebody, you know, was prying up the little wooden things with the nails in them that are all across the edge. What is that called? Tack strips, I believe they call those, around the edges to hold the carpet down. Oh, I don't like those things. Yeah, uh, it's funny because here in the new house, we got like the brand new tack strips. So the tacks are all still really sharp and Every now and then, you can feel it through, like, the edge of the carpet. It, like, if I have no shoes on, just barefoot or something, sometimes here and there I'll step and get stabbed by one of these. They eventually get less sharp as uh, the years go by or something. I'm not sure what the deal is and why they... But when they're brand new, it tends to be pokey. That's what my nephew was calling them, pokies. There's yeah. pokies here all over the floor. And then after that, after we had gotten all that stuff up, they foresaw, they prophesied that we would get mold. And so they had to like knock out the damp areas at the bottom of all the walls and uh, brought in all these industrial fans and were turning them on and said, you know, each one of these is going to cost you $20 a day. And we brought 16 over and we'll come back on Thursday to gather them. And they had some kind of sensor, like a uh, PKE meter or whatever that Ghostbusters have that they could hold up to the walls and show you, okay, this is how high the moisture is gone on these things. Um, yeah, then they had us get some kind of chemical and spray it in all the places to, to so the mold wouldn't prosper. It's been awful. And, uh, you know, I count myself lucky because most of the stuff I lost was, was inconsequential. It was like I had a big box of Star Wars guys and they were all ruined, but they weren't even my Star Wars guys. They were, you know, I, I bought them with the intention of selling them later. Can and, you still sell them 
loose. I'm going to sell them all loose. Yeah, I've taken them because the backs and all that were ruined and that, and I just yeah. took the bubbles and the figures. So and you get more for it if you have it in the package, right? Yeah, for some reason, Star Wars fans, I guess they're the worst, but <laughs> they're, they're the ones that really want everything to be in the package. And so many Star Wars collectors have to have one that's pristine and saved in, in, in its original packaging. And if they want to play with something, they'll buy a second. I, I know that's not universal, but I've talked to so many Star Wars fans that are like that. And I, my, my idea is, you know, if it's a toy, open it, play with it. Yeah, mine um, too. Because, you know, I collected Star Wars in the early 80s. And when I found out, oh, if you hadn't opened those, you would be so much richer today. And I didn't care. <laughs> like good. the money that you would give me would not outweigh the joy I had from playing with those in the sandbox or with my friends or in the snow or what, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I've got all these toys that I was talking about on the shelves here. And you can't display a toy in a box. You can't put it up on your shelf. I mean, you could, but how lame would that be? How unexciting? How, I mean, you can't pose it in some kind of cool pose. You can't do anything with it. It's just in a box. And basically, yeah, I'm definitely in your camp. So I would buy it loose anyways. I'm, and yeah, there, I had a ton of Transformers in their boxes and the boxes got ruined. But hopefully people will still want the Transformers just, you know, loose. Yeah, I, you may I lose a little money out of it. But, but yeah, it's, uh, for the most part, the only things that I'm, I'm bummed about are the books. Uh, I had a couple signed books that were ruined and, and then the posters. And I did mention that there was a story I had written in college and I never typed it up. And all that was left was the title and the first sentence. <laughs> and everything else was just this blue smear that had gone from page to page to page to page because I guess I'd written it all in ballpoint. From, and, what, from what I've heard, though, it, it's actually better now. Yeah, oh, it wasn't a very good story, I guess. <laughs> I, I, and the thing is, I have so many stories that it, losing one or several doesn't really matter. But yeah, you that know, is that's kind of a bummer, though. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm one of those people that really – is really what's the right word? Not paranoid, but really, I, I, I worry a lot about losing things that can't be replaced. So maybe I'm paranoid. So you're uh, really big into making backups. I I do like I, all the photos that we have, um, you know. And I used to do this as we'd get them back when we still developed pictures from film and stuff. I'd get it, I'd develop them, and I'd go immediately home with them, and I'd scan them all into the computer. Wow, that's great, man. And I've been doing this for years and years, scanning. And we've got my fam. My dad took all our pictures when I was growing up and did them on slides. And so I got myself a slide scanner and I started scanning all those pictures so that I'd have these pictures from when I was a child. And I do the same thing. We've got videotapes that we've done. And I've been steadily, you know, playing them out of the video camera and copying them onto the computer so that I have, you know, the tape, which is becoming obsolete i mean at least the pictures you know a photograph is never going to be obsolete you can always sit there and hold it in your hand and look at it it's not like a videotape where now there's nothing that you can do to play it with and watch it anymore there it doesn't exist anymore i mean just imagine how difficult it would be to play a vhs tape now i actually found several. i found a vcr in my basement oh yeah just last week going <laughs> through boxes i was like oh yeah i bought this in la right before i left wow yeah, I found several VHS tapes when I was unpacking this room. And I'm just like, the heck am I going to do with these? Did so you toss them? I tossed them. Yeah, I, I had a whole box of VHSs and I just tossed them. Yeah, I, I had I had a Sting Unplugged uh, VHS tape that you gave to me many years ago. And I just thought, oh, well, that's something I can't use anymore. That's too bad. So I just, yeah, I had to toss all these tapes. I'm just like, There's... and I think there are a few that actually have like, you know, home video stuff on them and i'm just thinking boy there's got to be i got to figure out some way to get this off of here but i probably won't i'll probably just in the end never have it but at least my uh my mini dv tapes i can still play into my computer i've got a lot to go though unfortunately because that was another thing that i was <sighs> i can't think of the right word not paranoid you're not paranoid about losing memories I don't know what the word would be, but I was really, I, I did a lot of video of my kids when they were little. I shot the heck out of those kids. I have so much coverage. I can make the greatest documentary. <laughs> yeah, I, sh I shot so much. Sometimes I would just like babies just there playing with toys and I just 
get the camera out and just sit there and shoot them. And I'd sit on them for like five minutes playing with their toys to the point where nobody wants to watch the videos. They're like, this is so boring. So I guess maybe it wasn't worth it. But someday they'll be like 40 and they'll be able to actually see what they were like when they were one, which is something I can't do. I don't have video of me. I can see a picture. There is some film, but yeah, I mean, it, it didn't hold up well, the film. I actually have done that too. I've transferred the film from when I was a kid onto video, which is now on mini DV tape, which eventually I'm going to capture on the computer. So I'll have it. But yeah, it's blurry. It's out of focus. It's dark. It's just so crappy. Which is, you know, I mean, it's what you expect. I mean, the majority of people's pictures, just their photographs, you look at them and they're just crappy. And even having a good camera doesn't mean you're going to get a good picture. But back then, they didn't have good cameras. They had those stupid little Super 8 cameras that had nothing to them but, you know, an on and an off switch. And you had to have the knowledge in your head that, hey, I need more light in here or I'm not going to get a good picture. But nobody did that because they didn't have that knowledge. So, yeah, it kind of makes me sad. I have, like, two VHS tapes that my sister, who was older and married, she came back for Christmas and used her video camera and videotaped me when I was, like, around 8 or 10 or something like that. And that's, like, it. It's all I have for video from when I was young. So I tried to make sure I had lots of that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really paranoid, really. I, I try to make sure that... None of that stuff is lost forever. And I always, you know, think about, you know, people's houses burned down. They're always like, oh, yeah, it's too bad because we lost all our pictures. And so I have things in portable way. I got a little portable hard drive that I got all the pictures loaded onto that I've done so far. And I grab that. I, what I really need to do is get one of those cloud storage things. Yeah, the virtual there. hard drive. My dad's actually been doing that. He's been scanning some of the slides that I haven't got to and he's like I'm just gonna upload these to the cloud and send you guys the link and you can just go to them whenever that'd be cool I need to do that with all my stuff too but I still have so much to go it's it's one of those things where you know it's it's a real undertaking to get them all scanned or captured or whatever in the first place and I'll, I'll get ambitious and I'll work on it for a month and get a quarter of the way through or something and then stuff gets in the way, life gets in the way, and then next time I think about doing it, I'm just like, oh, where did I leave off? Oh, jeez, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's me. It, it freaks me out. So this idea of you having the flood in your basement and this stuff being ruined, I suppose I could handle losing the books and the posters like you, you know, you can always buy, you can always buy another book. I mean, they make many copies of them. You can always buy another poster. Although, like you said, in some cases, the person who signed your poster is now dead. So you can't replace that. But, um, but yeah, the pictures, when you talk about the block of pictures that are just fused together, that makes me sad. Well, I, I had mentioned to you today at lunch that there was a picture of me and you at, at our college graduation. And, uh, I was just like, oh, hey, I should bring that to him. And, you know, pictures I didn't even know existed. I, I guess I took a bunch at our graduation. And uh, maybe I can bring them to you. You can scan them. Yeah, there you to go. Me, for some reason, scanning is, is hard for me. I don't like doing it. <laughs> I always have to do four or five different passes. It always, like, cuts off the side. And I'm like, oh, okay, so let me scoot it across. And then it cuts off even more. I was like, oh, I should have scooted it the other way. <laughs> Yeah, it can be a bit of a pain. It did take a lot of learning. When I first started scanning stuff, I would scan it like, I'm like, oh, I got to make sure that full quality. So I'd scan it like 1,200 dots per inch. And the files are so massive that they still crash my computer <laughs> 10 years later, you know. Just like, why did I do that? And so I actually had to go through and convert them all to a different size in a different format i would save them as tiffs tiffs are like, the gigantic ones like, right? yeah they're uncompressed so it's so much better i don't lose any info and then 10 years later i'm like oh gosh i'm gonna turn all these into jpeg so i can actually look at them but yeah i mean it's one of those things that you learn a little more each time you do it some uh, it, the funny thing is you know i'm so meticulous about it i think meticulous was the word that i was actually looking for yeah but you're not meticulous way. about losing 
par- I, paranoid works. I mean, okay. unless there's a, I was you're, you're whole, so preoccupied about losing, you know, so we worried. There's maybe there's a better word, but yeah, I thought was, paranoid was fine. It worked the way I said it. I think I was meaning to say I was meticulous in making sure that I don't lose anything. I would go through it very meticulously and make sure I have every little thing. But I'm so meticulous about it that I'm sure no one will ever want to see those pictures ever. My children will grow up and they'll learn to despise me and they'll never want to remember the times that we spent together. And, you know, all those pictures, all that time that I spent will be 100% wasted. Because that's the way, you know, the things that you care about work. It's always wasted. Well, now you're depressing me. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. And on that note. Dear Yame, I am so happy to tell you that I have successfully become an American citizen. I have a good job and have met a very kind man who appears to honestly love me. All your prayers were answered and now I can send for you and the entire family. The American dream is real, Yame. Thank you for never stopping believing in me. Kwame Mparo was selfishly texting some loser in Africa when her car jumped onto the sidewalk and ran down a CIA agent on his way to warn the president about an impending terrorist attack. Yes, the one that cost the lives of a million Americans, including Matt Damon, Adrian Peterson, and that pretty girl from that coming-of-age show on ABC. No text is worth making in the car. A message from the U.S. Safe Driving Board. Well, this has been an interesting that gets my go, wouldn't you say? I don't know if I'd call it interesting. Okay, well, what word are we looking for? Because that would for? imply that people were interested in listening to it. Mm. I think it just not necessarily went where we thought it would go. Perhaps. Okay. This has been quite a time-wasting that gets my goat. <laughs> there you folks. go. Perfect. But though, for those of you who stuck with it and listened all the way through, thank you. And we're sorry. <laughs> So I've been Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. See you next time, folks. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under the rated Cardman's average using non-commercial, no deliveries, 3.0 license. But that will be our little secret. Do you want me to save this at all or should I just chuck it? I think you can chuck it. Yeah, it's going to teach me nothing, it looks like, it's going very slow. Baby, change your mind. I'm the first in line. Baby, I'm still free. Take a chance on me. I was trying to determine if you say, if it's usury or usury. And it turns out it's usury. Hmm. Which was neither of the ways I pronounced it in the recording. So it's Uh. like, well, he's just going to say it wrong then.